Welcome back everyone. Today we are talking about the Mueller-Bresse law principle and how we can use it to find influence lines. Now the influence line is a specific response at a given point. So it could be a shear moment internal to your beam here, or it could be a reaction force or reaction moment at some other location. And that is calculated with respect to a unit load traveling across your structure. So by unit load, we mean it has a magnitude of one. Now the X axis, in your influence line is the position of that load. And the Y axis is whatever response you're looking at. So again, that could be a shear moment at some given point, or it could be a given reaction force or reaction moment. Now, the key behind the Mueller-Breslau principle is that influence lines always have very specific shapes and behaviors, either at the location that you're interested in or at your supports. So if we start with shear, we'll notice that the influence line for shear always has a jump of one at the location you're looking at. So for example, if I am looking at a shear right here, it's gonna come in, it's gonna be some negative number, it will jump up by one to some positive number, and then it will continue on its way. Similarly, if I'm looking at the moment, the moment influence line is always going to come to a peak. It's always going to have a change in slope of one. So it'll come in with some positive slope, it will have a change of slope of negative one, so it's gonna come down as a negative slope, and then it will continue on its way. Now, the last principle that we have to talk about is what happens if a load is directly at one of the supports. So let's say my load is directly above the support. We'll know that the reaction force at this location where the load is placed is equal to one, and my reaction at all other locations is zero. Similarly, there's going to be no shear and moment along the entire structure because nothing is actually deforming. The load is simply just going straight into my support. So what this means is that influence lines effectively respect your boundary conditions. So if I'm looking at shear moment here, if the load is placed at a support, I know for a fact that my influence right here for shear or moment or anything has to be equal to zero. Similarly, if you look at the reaction force influence line, when that load is directly above the position, it will have a magnitude of one and it will be zero at your other supports. So let's put this into action. The Mueller-Bresse law principle states that the influence line is equal to your deflected shape when you impose a unit deformation according to what type of response you're looking at. So if you're looking at shear, your unit response that you're going to impose is a jump of one. So here's a jump of one. It's going to come in and go out at the same slope. So the only thing I'm doing is I'm going to jump my structure by one. And I'm going to look at my displaced shape when I impose this deformation. So I'm going to take this piece out. That's going to be my position of interest. And I'm going to jump my structure by one right there. And we'll see that the shape of my structure is the shear influence line at this location. So it comes to some peak over here, I have my jump of one, and then I have some valley over on my third span right here. Now we can do the same thing for moment. So for moment, I'm going to come to a peak right here. So it's gonna to come to some angle where the change in slope of this angle is going to be negative one. And if I'm looking right here at mid-span, I'm going to take my jump of one out since I'm no longer looking at shear. And for moment, here is my change in slope of negative one. And I can see that this is my influence line for moment at this particular location. So it comes to a peak here and it's negative in the two side spans. Now, lastly, let's look at this for two of my reaction forces. So let's return the structure back to its original configuration. So we'll replace this back with the straight connector right there. And let's say I'm interested in my reaction force influence line for this support right here. So what I'll do is I'll just lift that by a unit deformation. So I'm lifting it by a distance of one. And we can see that I'll have a positive reaction force in that support right here if my load is anywhere between these two supports right here. So anywhere in these two spans. But if my load is in this final third span, the reaction force here is actually negative. So it's a, a pull down reaction force. And you can do this same idea with any of your supports. You can lift them by one and you can see the resulting influence line for a load, again, traveling across the structure. And the response is 
that reaction force where you have lifted your structure. So let's break this down with a few rules and principles so that we can see how we can also use this not to just find the shape, but also to find the values of your influence line. Our first rule for Mueller-Breslau will be to respect the release. So this means that we can really only have one release at a time, and it always takes a very particular shape. So for example, if we look at shear, there's only two options that you can have for the release at shear. So at the location of your shear, you can have something that looks like this or something that looks like this. And the jump is always going to be one going up and the slope in is always equal to the slope out. So things that are not allowed, you cannot have a jump of one down. You cannot also change the slope and you cannot have something that is continually increasing. So at best, you can have a horizontal in and a horizontal out or a slope in downwards and a slope out downwards, but you can't have two upward slopes. So this continues forever upwards. So all those options are disallowed. If we look at moment, we have a similar thing. We can only have a peak and the change in slope for the moment is going to be minus one. Now the two alternatives for this is to have a horizontal line and a slope of one going down or a slope of one coming in and then a horizontal line. So once again, these have to be a change in slope of one. Things that are not allowed, you cannot have a valley, you cannot have two increasing slopes and you can't have any kind of jump involved in your influence line for moment. So all those are once again disallowed. Our second rule is to respect the supports. So as we saw earlier, your influence line will always have a value of zero when you pass through your support. And furthermore, if you have a fixed support, it's going to have a value of zero and a slope of zero. So let's do some examples. Let's look at the shear at this location. I know I only have a few options for the shear, like what it looks like at that location. So if I draw starting off with my supports, I know at that fixed end, I have zero slope, zero displacement, and I'm going to have to pass through this point here. So because I'm coming in with zero slope and zero displacement, my shear has to look like this, horizontal in and horizontal out. So I'm going to jump up by one, and then I come over to my hinge, and that comes down at a slope down through my pin. Likewise, if I look at the moment at the same location, if I satisfy my supports, I know I have to have zero slope and zero displacement here. And it's going to have to pass through this point here. So once again, this is going to be a horizontal line and therefore my option for the moment release looks like this. So a horizontal coming in, a slope of one going down, coming out. So it's down of one and then it hits my hinge and it comes back up through the point where I had my support. Next, looking at a second case, let's just try this again with three supports. Here, I'm going to look at V at that particular location, and we can see that I'm going to pass through these points for all my supports. Now, the only option that I have for V in this case is going to come down like that, because I'll see that I have a shape that has these negative slopes coming in and out of my point of interest. So then I can draw my line, a straight line back, hits my hinge and straight line back this way, draws the influence line for that. Now, if we look at moment at that same location, I know in this case, my moment is gonna to come to a peak and it has to pass through these three points. So therefore I come to a peak right there and then I can go back, I hit my hinge and then I can continue back with a straight line passing through my support. Our final rule for Mueller-Brest law is to consider determinacy. So all the systems that I've looked at so far are determinate, which means you can solve for them using statics alone. If you have an indeterminate system, things change a bit. All the systems on the screen are indeterminate and I will have to satisfy conditions that will have zero influence at the supports and then zero influence and zero slope there at my fixed end. And let's just say I'm looking at shear right here. So I know that span is going to look something like this. That's really my only option. And my cantilever span can just come back and that works great. However, for my final span, it's coming in at a, a negative slope and I'm going to have to come back to this point. And so that means I have to bend my diagram. So it has to bend and come back to zero slope, zero displacement. So indeterminate systems will almost always have bent shapes. Likewise, if I look at my moment here, 
I'm going to have a peak at that location. So I know pretty well what that span is going to look like. But in order to come back to my point of zero slope and zero displacement, it's going to have to bend back to get to that location. Now, if we look at multi-span systems, we'll notice that the influence line because of this is always going to alternate back and forth. So let's look at shear in this end span. And I know that diagram for shear there is going to look something like this, but now I have to satisfy my supports at the end here. So it's going to have to deflect down, but it's going to bend back up and then bend back down in this sort of S-shape pattern. And if we had more spans, that would continue down the line, alternating up, down, up, down. And the same thing that happens for moment. So if I'm looking at moment in this end span, in the end span, we'll have a peak, and then I'm going to have to alternate down, up. And if I had further spans continuing past that, I would have this curve continuing on down those spans. Now that we have some general principles for Mueller-Bress law, let's apply this to find influence lines with values for a determinate system. Now, this is very challenging for indeterminate systems because you have those curves, and so you can't usually rely on geometry alone, but for determinate systems, this works very well, and all we need to know is some geometry and calculating heights and slopes. So let's look at, for example, the shear and the moment at this location for the structure that we have drawn here. And we've already seen these influence lines. So for shear, I know we have a jump of one there and it comes back and down at my end. And for my moment, I know I have a peak here and this line therefore continues to the left. It hits my hinge and comes through my support on the other side. Now, starting with shear, I know that the jump is always one. And so if I look at shear, we'll say this distance here is y1 and this distance here is y2. So therefore, y1 plus y2 is equal to one. Furthermore, with shear, we know that our slope theta here is the same slope in and out. So both of those slopes theta are equal and therefore y1 is equal to the slope theta times the distance six and y2 is the same slope theta times the distance 10. Now plugging those back into y1 plus y2 is equal to one, tells me that 16 times theta is equal to one or theta is one over 16. Now that I know that slope, I can easily find my values. y1 is 1 16th times six, so this is negative 16 16th or negative three over eight. Therefore, this is five over eight. And I can see that this slope is the same theta. So this value is going to be positive one half. Now, if I look at the two triangles here, these two triangles are identical triangles. And so therefore I know that this slope, which was theta is also this slope theta over here. So continuing that slope back, I can see that it's the same slope of 1 16th times a distance of eight. So this is negative one half. Now let's do the same idea for the moment. So for moment, our slope changes by one. So let's label the two slopes theta one and theta two. And therefore I know that theta one plus theta two must be equal to one. Now to calculate those slopes, I know that they're both going to come to the same H located right here. So if we look at H, H is either equal to six times theta one or 10 times theta two. And so therefore, theta one is equal to five thirds theta two. So I'll substitute theta one back in here, and that allows me to say that eight thirds times theta two is equal to one, or theta two is three eighths, which means that theta one is five eighths. Now I can go ahead and find my height h. So height h here is going to be my slope, of five eighths times distance of six. So that's 30 over eight or equivalently 15 over four for that peak. I have the same slope going back here. So that's five eighths times a distance of eight. So therefore this is going to be negative five. And I can see once again, I have similar triangles here and here. So both of those have the same slope. So this slope here is also going to be five eighths and therefore that gives me a value of five at the end. And that wraps up our discussion of using Mueller-Breslau to find influence lines. We can see it's a very powerful tool that we can use to find influence lines very quickly. 
We can even find the values of determinant systems just using some simple geometry. So I hope you learned something. Please subscribe and I will see you next time.